every other name in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. First Kings chapter 18. First Kings chapter 18, verses 36 through 39. As you're turning, wait for it to appear on the screens. Uh, a reminder that this month is already almost gone. And we got two weeks left out of a five five weekend month. And so um, the 31st, which is coming up the last Sunday of this month, I want to remind you that we are having church at the Hilton. Amen. And if you don't know where the Hilton is, get with somebody after church. We want to make sure you know how to get there. But it's a beautiful facility. And a lady is so kind there that used to come to church here and rent this out the room. And so we're going to have an evangelist, Brother Whittlemore, is going to be preaching. And I'm just expecting God to do something great. Amen. In among his people. Hallelujah. First Kings chapter 18. I do have a specific message from the Lord. Sunday was a little bit weird for me because God's voice was a little bit hard to follow just a tad. And so... Um, Last night around 1230, I got this message. I didn't know what God was going to do. Or we just get here and pray together and encourage one another. But I heard from God. I have a specific message from God. Amen. First Kings 18, 36 says, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant. And that I have done all these things at thy word. A lot of good information in that text. Verse 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me. That this people may know that thou art the Lord God. And that thou hast turned their heart back again. And the then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. And the wood and the stones and the dust. And licked up the water that was in the trench. Last, last verse. And when all the people saw it. They fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. Amen. I want to talk to you tonight on this talk. Probably going to do a little bit of teaching tonight, if that's okay. But I want to talk to you on this topic, a God that will prove himself. Amen. This is the, the message that God put in my spirit last night. A God that will prove himself. Let's pray one more time. God, I thank you for everybody watching online. I thank you, God, for everybody that is present tonight, God. I'm asking you to help me, God, deliver this word. Help it to fall the way it's supposed to fall, God. I want it to encourage and build up just like your word does. And we thank you for it today. And the church said in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Hallelujah. If we look at the definition of proof, many of us know what it means, but it means to demonstrate the truth or existence of something by evidence. If you've ever accused anybody of something and they say, prove it. And it used to be in this nation that you were innocent until proven guilty. Amen. I guess it's still like that a little bit. But the word prove is to demonstrate the truth or existence of by evidence. Now let's go back, and you don't have to turn there. I'm going to do a little talking if that's okay. First Kings chapter 18. The setting of my scripture text, we all know the story, or at least the majority of us knows where Elijah is on Mount Carmel, and, and it's the fire of God falling. It's the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove. And Elijah is essentially by himself. The prophets of Baal are 450 people. So it's one against 450. Amen. The odds are stacked against Elijah. I'm talking about a God that will prove himself. This is what Elijah said. How long are you going to be between two opinions? A wise man once said, you either can tie your shoe on the left side or the right side, but you got to pick one. Brother Steinhauer told me that. How long are you going to be between two opinions, right? There comes a time where you got to know the truth. you got to prove some things. Amen. And this is where Israel was because of their sin. They were between Baal and God. Baal and God. And God is a jealous God. He's not going to share his glory with another. It's either all God or no God. Amen. Because he's not going to share with any other God. And so they were between Balaam, which is a false God, and God. 
Amen. Jesus wasn't there yet, but he already had his name. But God. And this is what Elijah said. He said, when he makes the, uh, he says, and, and call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. That had to take a lot of confidence from Elijah, because essentially he just said, if Baal answers, then I'll serve Baal. Whichever God answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Amen. There are times talking won't cut it. God has to prove it. And I say this in a respectful way because this is what God is wanting me to talk to you about. God proving himself to you. And Elijah is talking to a unrighteous nation and says, all right, this is the deal. If God answers, you got to serve him. If Baal answers, we'll all serve Baal. So then it puts everything on God. We're fixing to allow God the opportunity to prove himself. Amen. I don't believe in walking around asking God to prove himself all the time. Okay? I'm talking about God proving himself. But there are times in dire situations that God will prove himself to you. How many in here has ever had God prove himself to you? Amen. Through different situations and circumstances. Amen. God will prove himself to you. This is what Elijah said whenever Baal did not answer. He said, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day. Elijah's putting God on the spot. Does anybody here need anything from God this day? Right? Okay. Elijah is getting serious with God. And there are times that you can get serious with God and say, all right, God, I need you to do it for me. I need you to prove it in a respectful way, not in a disrespectful way. But Elijah said, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things by thy word. Thy word is very important because God will always prove himself on his word, not your word. Okay. God will always prove himself by his word. And it's not always not by our word. There are times that he will prove himself by our word. But let me explain that. So if you wake up tomorrow morning and you say, all right, God, you send somebody to give me a million dollars today or I don't believe you're God. God's not going to do that for you because he's not going to prove himself in a way that's destructive to you. Because somebody giving you a million dollars could make you backslide. Amen. He's not going to prove himself in a way that's destructive to you. Amen. But if God is dealing with you about something and God, that's what the prophet Elijah, he said, God, I'm your servant and I've done all this by your word. It was not Elijah's idea to go to Mount Carmel. It was God's idea. And it's very important that the majority of stuff that we do. It's God's idea. Amen. There's God's idea and then there's our ideas. When we get into situations where we're proving God, it needs to be God's idea. Because Elijah said, God, I'm your servant. I've done all this by your word. You told me to come here and tell him that there's going to come rain again. And you can prove God in certain situations like that. And I'll give you another example. I was preaching a revival in Huntington, Texas. And God began to deal with me about a spirit that was there. And he showed me this elderly lady who had long white hair and she was beautiful. That's the spirit. I'm talking about the spirit, not the actual lady. And God said she's old because she's been here for a while. Well, he showed me her. And some people may think this is crazy, but y'all, I'm being, I'm being truthful with you, okay? He showed me her on the outside of the facility. And God said, I've put her on the outside because she's not allowed in the church. And so I saw her to the left of the facility, and God's like, you're going to talk about this spirit. I'm like, no, I'm not. That's crazy. I'm, I'm not getting up there. They're going to think I'm crazy, and they're going to cancel the revival on me. And like walking in the facility, and so I had never seen the left side of the building because God showed me this spirit. Y'all believe in spirits? If you believe in the Holy Ghost, you've got to believe in spirits, okay? I had a guy tell me one time, he said, there's spirits out here. I said, okay. 
He said, you believe in that? I said, I don't know. I said, but do you believe in the Holy Ghost? The conversation stopped. Amen. But um, he showed me her sitting on the AC condenser. The big thing outside, is that the condenser? Okay, just making sure. And they had the church and the fellowship hall. It was right up against the church. And so there was a little bitty space in between the two buildings. And there was an AC unit sitting right there. That's what God showed me. I had not seen it in real life before. God's been talking to me about the spirit. God's like, you're going to tell these people about the spirit. I said, God, I'm not doing that. I said, they're going to think I'm crazy. And I'm walking in the facility. And God says, you walk around the side of the church and see if what I showed you is not real. I'm, saying, I'm talking about a God that proves himself. Right? And so I'm like, oh, I'm about to open the door. I'm like, I don't want to do that. So I'm like, all right. I went around. Brother James, exactly what God showed me in the vision. Identical. And I had never seen that side of the building. And I was just like, okay, that's God. That's God. Now I'm going to talk about this spirit. And you know, when I begin to talk about that spirit, God said this spirit has been given power. She's an old, beautiful lady because she's been there for a long time. He said this spirit has been given power. She waits outside of the church. When people come in and leave, not changed, she attaches herself to them and she goes home with them and wrecks chaos on their life. And I begin to talk about these things. And God began, I'm telling you, spirits have a certain amount of power. That's why you got to plead the blood of Jesus over your life. But I'm saying in situations like that where God is wanting to use you and you are uncomfortable in what he's trying to use you in, you can say, all right, God, I'm going to need you to prove yourself. I'm going to need you to almost, God, help me because God wants you to know that it is him. Amen. The whole reason why God did what he did on Mount Carmel is because he wanted to change the people's heart. Let me tell you another situation that happened in Huntington. And there's a lot of cool things that happened at that church with me. But there was a man there. So God woke me up one morning and began to deal with me about Moses and about his disability. Because when God called Moses, Moses says, I can't talk good. And so that was his excuse. He's like, I, I can't talk good and whatever. And so I, I, I went and I preached that morning about Moses' disability. I don't care what you have, blah, blah, blah. And so at the end of the service, this man came up and he was just crying. He had a disability. But he's just crying, crying, crying. And we prayed for him and God touched him. And after service, he said, he said preacher, I got to tell you something. I said, okay. And he said, I told God this morning. This is the last time I'm coming to church unless the message is right for me. He said, I'm not coming to church no more. He said, God, but I need something from you. If you will give me something when I get there that I need, he said, I will, I will come to church again. But he said, if I get there and I don't, you don't give me anything, I'm not ever coming to church again. And then God told me to preach on disabilities, and he had a disability. I'm talking about a God that will prove himself. Not all the time, but there are dire situations, I'm telling you, where God goes out of his way to prove to you that he's for you and that he loves you and that he's willing to help you. Amen. If we study Moses, the entire reason why God gave Moses the powerful signs was God proving himself to Moses. God says, hey, Moses, I'm going to use you to call the children of Israel out of Egypt. You're going to lead them out of Egypt. Moses answered and said, they will not believe me nor hearken to my voice. For they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said, what is in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. And Moses fled. So Moses was holding a literal rod. And God says, I'm fixing to prove to you that I'm going to do what I'm saying I'm going to do. And Moses threw it on the ground, and that rod became a snake. I would, I would flee too. I don't blame you, Brother Michael. And God said, all right, stick. that's the first sign of God proving himself. Then God said, stick your hand in your bosom. He stuck his hand in his bosom, pulled out his leprous. God said, pull it back. Put it back in. He pulled it out, it was healed. And God said, Moses, if you go to the people and they don't believe you on the first sign, which is throwing the rod down. And they don't believe you on the second sign. I want you to get water out of the river. And so listen. The whole point of me telling all these signs. 
A lot of the reasons why God, the Bible says, these signs shall follow them that believe, that's God trying to prove himself to a lost and dying generation. Every sign that God gave Moses was to prove himself to Moses. And can you believe after all them great signs, Moses said, wait, I don't talk good. Amen. That would have been enough for me. I don't know about you, Brother Son Howard, but if, if God says, throw that hanky on the ground and all of a sudden it becomes a frog, I'm like, all right, I'll believe you, God. Amen. Moses was chosen, and I've come, listen, I, I've come to tell somebody tonight, th this is straight from God. I don't know if somebody's been specifically praying this, or you're needing God to prove himself in some way. I've come to tell someone tonight that God will prove himself to you. God is going, or will, prove himself to you. I feel it so strong in my spirit tonight. God will prove himself to you. You. Amen. You know why? Because God does not play cat and mouse. God does not play cat and mouse. He wants you to know it's him. He is very clear. He is very direct. And I'm thankful for that because sometimes you feel like that with God. And if you feel like God's playing cat and mouse, stop it. He's not. Don't get in that mind game. God is very clear. God is very direct. You wait on him. And you serve him, and when it comes time for proving, he will prove himself to you because there's plenty of times that he's going to make you prove yourself to him. Amen. He told the children of Israel, he told Moses, he said, bring the children of Israel out, and I'm going to see if they're going to walk in my law or not. Amen. But let me tell you the beautiful thing about God is he's going to prove you, but he will also allow you circumstances and situations where you can prove him and say, all right, God. I don't believe it unless you show it to me. Now listen, that attitude can be very dangerous if it's not connected to his word. It can't be like, all right, God, you give me $18,000 a day or I don't believe anything you say. No, it can't be that. But there are situations where it's like, all right, God, I really need you to come through for me because I don't want to make a mistake. I've told this story many times before, but the situation with my house back in Nacogdoches. Amen. We found the house. We were going to buy a house. And I told my wife, I said, I want to buy this house, but I need God's approval. I'm like, God, I'm serious. Like, I'm not fixing to jump off in the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt without you letting me know. Like, you're going to catch me if I fall. You know? And so, literally, like we're fixing to put the offer in on the house. And I don't put the offer in. We have a church service that church service that night, and there's a visiting evangelist. Is this all right tonight? He don't know nothing about my house situation. And I say, all right, God, literally we're reading the text. He says, all right, everybody turn to the book of blah, 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 and turn to this scripture. And I'm like, all right, God, if you're okay with me buying this house, you got to be really careful with this. You really got to know the voice of God. You can't be... I'm teaching tonight from a standpoint because God has told me to teach it. But you, you got to be careful with this. You can't be like, God, if it's your will for me to go to Whataburger, let a sparrow fall out of the ground. You know, nothing like that. You know, but I said, God, this was a big situation. It's a big deal to you. It's a big deal to God. Always remember that. If it's a big deal to you, it's a big deal to God. He cares and he loves you. But I said, God, if it's your will for me to buy this house, I want you to let that evangelist that knows nothing about my situation, approve it. That's a pretty big deal. I mean, God would really have to work a miracle. Like, I was making it hard for God. And literally, I'm telling you that God's on his truth. He reads his scripture text. And he stops. And he says, before I preach, God keeps talking to me about this house. I'm telling you, as soon as he said house, I started speaking in tongues. I did. I felt the Holy Ghost. And he said, God has chosen this house for you, and he's going to bless you with it. I bought that house in 2016. I sold it in 2020, and I lived in it for all four years for free, and I made money when I got out of it. That's no disrespect, you know. But I'm, I'm saying, God saw the future. 
And God set it up perfectly. Like if I would have lost money, it still wouldn't, that, that still wouldn't have dictated where I wouldn't have been mad at God. But I'm just saying, I'm like, God, if you give me the approval, I will do it. Because I don't want to do nothing at my word. I want it to be your word. God, I'm waiting on your word. Now listen, just because you're going through tough situations, right? If you lose a house, lose a car, lose a business, that doesn't mean that God didn't prove himself. That doesn't mean that your life is falling apart even though it may be tough. These are not perfect situations. But what I am telling you, because God has dealt with me about it, if you are wanting God to prove himself or you in a situation that you don't know what to do, wait on God. Talk to him and be like, God, if this is your will, I want you to show me it's your will. I want you to prove that this is what you have for me because I feel like he will do it. Amen. When Gideon, and I'm almost done preaching, this ain't going to be long tonight. When Gideon was called to deliver Israel from the hand of Midian, the angel came to him, Sister Steinhauer. The angel said, you're called, mighty men of valor. You're going to deliver Israel the hand of Midian. And do you know that Gideon still wanted a sign? The angel would have been enough for me. They were spoiled back then. You're telling me an angel of God appears to you and says, you're called, you're chosen, you're a mighty man of valor, you're going to lead the children of Israel who's been oppressed by Midian for seven years. You're going to lead them out. And the angel of the Lord goes to leave. And Gideon says, hang on a second, I need you to make double sure and prove it. Do you know the angel told him to make a sacrifice and the fire, the fire of God fell and consumed it and that was Gideon's sign? And later in the chapter, right before Gideon is to go up, Gideon says, God, one more time, if you are going to deliver the hand of Midian into our hands, if you're going to help me deliver Israel, I want you to prove it. You know what he does? He gets a handkerchief and he says, all right, God, is this okay tonight? Am I giving you too much information too fast? I'm sorry. It's all in my head. He says, I'm going to get a handkerchief or wool. And he said, I'm going to put it on the ground. And he said, if the hanky is wet and all the ground is dry, the hanky's wet with dew and all the ground is dry, I'll know that it's a sign that you're going to do what you told me you're going to do. Okay? He wakes up the next morning. Bam, done. Now, that's a pretty big deal. Y'all realize that mirror. He puts a handkerchief on the ground and says, God, if it's your will, let just the handkerchief be wet with dew, none of the grass. Right? You get up one morning, a bunch of dew everywhere, you pray that, and that's, that's right. I'm like, wow. And, and, and God answers it. And you know what he does again? He says, God, I want to make double sure. Three times. I'm telling you, the best thing is to take God by his word. But because God loves you and he wants to teach you, I tell people all the time, I say, God wants you to know it's his voice. Because he wants you to teach, he wants to teach you what his voice sounds like because he wants to use you. Amen. And so then Gideon flipped it on God. He said, All right. He said, I want to put this handkerchief out on the grass and the dew be on the grass and not the handkerchief. He switched it. That's a big deal, isn't it? That's cool. God said, Okay. He put the handkerchief out. Next morning, the grass was wet, but the handkerchief was not red. Wet. And Gideon said, all right, God's going to deliver them into our hands. I don't know what you're asking God for tonight, or I don't know what God is telling you he wants to do. But I'm telling you, I feel like you have the authority, if you want to, to fleece God to make sure. Amen. So, God will always prove himself by his word. Very seldom does God tell us to prove him. But one of the ways is in Malachi. I'm not here to preach on giving or money because y'all are faithful in giving and money. But this is the word prove. I searched the word prove and this come up. But God said, bring all the tithes in the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me with it. See if I will not open up the windows of heaven. There are situations that God says, look, test me. There's times, raise your hand if you have been tested. Do you know God gives you the authority to also test him 
almost like an ex a science experiment, but a serious one. It's like, oh, what happens if we mix Mentos with Diet Coke? It explodes. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you tested God? That's what I really feel. A little bit. When's the last time you said, all right, God, if you said it, I believe it. I'm going to do it. I don't care how it leaves me. And you put yourself in a situation where God is the only one. His word is the only thing you've got left. Can I tell you, God has put me there time after time. And I'm telling you, every time he will come through for you because he cannot lie. His word will not return void. When's the last time you said, all right, I'm tired of being comfortable. God, here's the, the handkerchief. I want to know if it's you. God, here's what you're asking. I want to know. Prove it right now, God, and I will believe it for the rest of my life. Doubting Thomas said this. I'm almost done. After Jesus had already been resurrected, he said, except I see and touch the nails in his hands, I'm not going to believe Maybe I'm preaching to somebody here or online that is like the doubting Thomas. And sometimes it's hard to believe when you don't see it. But you know what? When God filled Sister Zoe with the Holy Ghost, that was my God, I need to see it. I need to see it. The devil was fighting me on it. I need to see it. And you know what God does? God showed up and said, hey, Thomas, give me your hands. You know what he did when he felt it and he saw it? He said, my Lord and my God. In other words, I've, I've, said all, I've said this whole service that God will always prove himself by his word. But that is one time in scripture where he proved himself by a doubting word. Thomas doubting. That wasn't God's word. That wasn't God's faith that said, if I, if I don't see it, I'm never going to believe it. No, but God came to where his doubt was and said, I'm fixing to prove to you that I am who I say I am. Who is, who is needing God to do that for you? Can I tell you he is able to prove himself to you? This is what God told me last night. I was, I was walking around the church. I was right where Sister Alma was. It's what God told me. Listen. Two, two or three things God told me very directly. He said, I want my people to see me for what my word says I am. I want my people to see me for what my word says I am. If his word says he's a deliverer, that's what we see him as. If his word says he's a healer, that's what I see him as. But if I have doubt in some of those areas, God has said, I'm giving you the authority to say, all right, God, I want you to prove yourself. I want you to show me so I can have a deeper or stronger relationship with you because I want to know for myself. That was, one of, that was the two or three things that God told me directly. Here's the third one. What really infuriates, everybody say infuriates. What really infuriates God is when he proves himself to you, but you still refuse to believe it. We have to be careful with this as a church body and family. That when God shows up and he proves himself time and time again, and we find ourselves in the same situation, and he's proved it in prior situations, that we don't let that doubt and unbelief creep in. Amen. That's what God spoke to me. Because he had the same issue in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 9 that said, this is talking about the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, I told you you have the right to tempt God. Not in a bad way, but in a godly way. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for, 44 year, for 40 years. They proved God. They cried, he fed them. Right? God, I'm going back to Egypt unless you send manna. How many times has God came with a miraculous service that you were almost at your wit's end fist to quit? You know what God was doing to you? He was proving himself to you. Amen. Yes. He was showing you that he's still working for you. He was showing you that he is still moving things for you. Verse 10. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they always err in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath. They shall not enter into my rest. Can you put verse 12 up there? 
Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. After he has shown himself time and time again, make sure that an evil heart of unbelief don't creep back in. Because I want to tell you tonight, God will prove himself to you. He's going to prove himself to you. Amen. I believe it. That's what I feel. I don't care the situation. Give God the opportunity. He will let you know. Amen. Can we pray right now? Jesus, I thank you for your word tonight. I pray, God, tonight that this went to somebody that was struggling, God, or that may be having doubts or needing something from you, God. Amen. I pray, God, as a whole right now that... Amen. We would believe you, God, but that we would also understand that you are open to be proven, God, in a respectful way, God. Not one that is birthed out of anger or frustration, God, but one that is to secure or to know that we are in your will or doing what you want. I thank you, God, for, for, for confirming your word, God, and allowing things to happen that allows us to know that it is you. I thank you for it today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. There was a time that I was struggling. God had told me to do something. Last story and I'm done. God had told me to do something. And I got to the point. Sometimes you get to the point you're like, well, I don't know if it's really God, but I'm going to do it anyways. I feel it's like you weigh your options. You're like, it's good all the way around. I don't want to miss God. God, I hope it's you. I keep feeling it. I don't know. And if you keep feeling it, there's a good sign that it's God. Keep feeling it. And I did what he told me to do. Leaving, I said, God, you don't have to let me know why you told me to do that. But I would really appreciate it if you would like confirm that I really heard your voice. Because I didn't want to think that I was just speaking to myself. I didn't want to appear crazy, you know. And I was like, God, I said, first off, God, you don't have to. I said, but if you would, I would greatly appreciate it. And the word got back to me that basically what God had told me to do, it helped out the family. They were in a dire situation. The wife had had cancer. There was a little bit left over of the chemo bill. They didn't know how they were going to pay it. And just all the, and, and it wasn't about nothing else. But when I got that, Brother Michael, I was like, yes. God proved himself to me. Because it's like, it's like shooting at a target, right? Who in here enjoys missing no, you don't. And in ministry, you got to be really careful. Because these words from God, we just don't pull them out of Google. Because y'all are going to know. Wait a second, that's just crazy. That guy's crazy. I heard Joel Osteen preach that last week. No, I'm just kidding. Right? The Spirit of God is speaking. And there's many times that I, I tell what God has told me. And people come and say, that was on my mind all day. That was on my mind all day. Well, I'm just saying it's good that we are in tune with the voice of God. Amen. Amen. i got to be in tune with the Spirit. I'm like, God, thank you for letting me hit it. And over time, God will teach you His voice. And He will teach you how to recognize His voice. Because when He tells you to do something... You will have confidence instead of doubt. He wants you to be confident and say, all right, that's my father's voice. I know what it sounds like. All right, I'm doing it. Amen. I'm doing it. Just like you, Sister Tamara, you said you had that feeling. You know. You know. Amen. Let's stand all over the house. I'm done preaching. Thank you for being a good congregation tonight. Amen. Thank you for coming. Let's remember, uh, remember to be in prayer for our youth. Amen. As they're traveling back, different ones traveling. And so... We're willing. We'll see you back Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Amen. Expecting to see something great. Amen. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Jesus. Keep brother and sister Kyle in your prayers. You're dismissing the fear and the love of the Lord. God bless you.